Brother Rooster, our worship master, is with us. Good to see you this morning, Brother Rooster. Good morning. Good morning. Sorry to hear about your diagnosis. I am too. Didn't do a <laughs> thing for me. Let me lay over there all day long. Didn't do nothing for my blood pressure. And then just come in and tell me this bunch of stuff. You have when COVID the, and uh, hypertension, you said. <laughs> no, told me I had COVID and pneumonia. Pneumonia, that's what it was. Pneumonia. And I said, I don't even have a bit of symptoms. I ain't had right. nothing. Uh, Just went from a blood test, and the girl told me, she said, uh, we're going to do a COVID test on you. I'll bet you any amount of money you come back to positive. Okay. <laughs> said, but you don't I'll have any symptoms. <clears throat> no, I haven't had none. I told him, I said, yeah, I'll bet you I will, too, if you tell me that. Right. That's funny. Well. Yeah, it's. Oh, well, that, that is unfortunate because you're going to miss the meeting. It looks like I'm going to miss the meeting, too, uh, because um, a good friend of mine, well, someone I've known forever and ever and ever, uh, got a brother named Jack Pallet. He's active in the, the shrine down here and the Jobies. And I've known his daughter forever, and we've been friends a long time, and he just passed away. And his service is going to be next Saturday, so I won't be there for the, the stated I was almost going to suggest if you wanted to move it, we could move it since you won't be there and I won't be there, but I don't know. But Charles, your is call. Going, Charles is going to take over. You mean, I, I didn't contact him. Okay. He's, he's going to you take mean, care of that. Bro Bronson, you mean Robert? Robert. 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 <laughs> <Not Charles. laughs> I'm thinking Charles Bronson. Oh, Charles Bronson. Oh, that's <laughs> funny. Yeah, Chuck, Chuck Bronson. We'll just yeah. call him that. Let's call him Chuck. I like that. Chuck Bronson. <laughs> Well, I mean, I'm sure he can. It's just, I'm just, I'm upset that I'm, I don't know the time, but I know it's going to be Saturday sometime. So that's going to be difficult. I can't, I can't miss the, the service. I know his family. Yeah, well, 10 so. o'clock Saturday. And, and I contacted him and let him know yeah. and, you know, told me how to speak or coming and everything. And, right. Got it all. We're all I, just, set. I just hate to miss it, but. Me too. You know but... we do? <laughs> well, we, we could always move it, but that's, that's your call. Um, uh, brother iPhone, uh, I don't have a name, I just have iPhone just joined us. You want to say hello? Kind of surprised Brian's not here. He normally tells me if he can't make it. Hello, you guys heard me? Oh, hey, is that John? No, this is Mon Monar from. Hammond San Jacinto Lodge, 338, oh, California. You. Thank you. Thanks right. for having me. Can you can you uh, change your name so I can get your name just for the record of who's attended? If you don't mind. Uh, okay. If you want to spell it for, I will spell it for a B O N, like James Bond. Take the D off. Okay. B O N, uh -huh. first name, last name is Munar. M U N A R. Past Master 2016. Okay. I, I was going to ask if you can. I was going to ask if you could change your name. Do you know how to change your display name? On the no. Meeting? If you don't, that's quite all right. Okay. That's fine. Okay. All right. All right. I, I do have a system that tells me everybody's name and email if they have it entered. Uh, sometimes it's just a number, a phone number. <laughs> but I like that because Zoom gives me after the fact how many people attended and what their names are, so I can keep just loose records of how many attendees we have and how many repeat offenders we have with us. <laughs> uh, <laughs> good to have you with us, uh, Bon. And you're saying you're in California, you said? Yes, uh, I'm in Riverside County, California. Oh my. And I'm is... also a member of uh, Scottish Rite Palm Spring Valley. Excellent. Uh, so it's 7 a.m. there. Well, I appreciate you making yes, it to get here yes. early. <laughs> Yes, I have sir. to say, brothers, uh, at 10 o'clock on a Saturday works for the majority of people. Inevitably, somebody complains. But because we have so many brothers in England and Scotland and that area who attend, it's three in the afternoon for them. It's not a, a big deal. Um, 10 in the morning isn't bad for me. I could go an hour earlier. I just kind of I'm kind of killing time on a Saturday morning waiting to start. But it works well for me. But we can still have people on the West Coast even attend. It's not terribly inconvenient. But we have a worldwide audience with these uh, these meetings, so yes. you can you can always pick a time where it's somebody is going to have to get up in the middle of the night if they want to attend. So yes. I just want to serve the majority of us. So I appreciate you making an effort 
also uh, my brother if i can if i can uh, speak a little bit Go more ahead. i'm sorry to uh, cut you off there Go are uh, many brothers in the philippine masonry who wants to join this uh, uh, zoom meeting and i think seven o'clock uh, california time it's going to be there 10 o'clock uh, in the evening there one day advance say mm -hmm. sunday night so is it okay if i will let them know and invited him in the future absolutely absolutely right. thank, if thank they can brother. If the time's not too bad, yeah. I guess the only yeah, time it's the really time bad is perfect. Is... The time is perfect for them there at this time. Sorry. Right. No, and that's 10 o'clock at night. That works. So I guess the people who really are going to not, it's not going to work for people in like Hawaii or mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, the, <laughs> Japan. You know, middle of, yeah. uh, middle of, um, middle Pacific. of a, a Pacific, uh, yeah. it's the middle of a the night there, but yes, you know, oh, Steve's here. Good. Um, Okay, people coming in. Uh, let's see. I wanted to say I saw somebody else come in. Oh, brother, uh, brother Clark, good to have you with us, sir. <laughs> are you in your? Is that a steering wheel? Are you in your truck? <laughs> okay, <laughs> great to have you with us. All right, and uh, brother Spence, nice to see you again, brother. Hi, brother uh, Christopher Douglas, nice to see you, brother. Hey, how you been? It's been a while, and I'm glad you're back. And I even invited a friend, uh, uh, brother um, Robert Kleiman, might be on too. I don't know, maybe he beat me today. Very good. So uh, I told him about you, and he was, yeah, it doesn't look like he's there. But anyway, uh, nice to be on again, brother. You look pretty sharp there with a uh, haircut and everything. Yes, pretty just got a haircut. I see you got a little little yeah. stuff growing down here. You got the Ted Nugent thing going on. <laughs> there is, there is a COVID nineteen uh, scene happening. <laughs> well, it's good to have you back here. There, there yeah. are several of you. Like Steve, you've been around from the beginning. I think you're one of the earlier think, ones. Brother, yeah, it's lovely to be here again, and good to see you. Yeah, well, thank you for coming. Uh, Brother Manan, good to have you here from India, apparently. Yeah, that's awesome. Wow. Hello. How do you do, all of you, brothers? Hello, my brother. Good to have you here. So what time is it in India right now? Uh, it's uh, it, it's 8.30 in the evening. Okay. See, that's not bad. I mean, Lodge is normally around this yeah, time. Yeah. I can people. join some more meetings uh, in the future. Okay. Very yeah. good, Brother Manan. Uh, Nice to see you there from the Indian subcontinent. That's a long way off. This Anybody is from in here from me uh, who has been to India? I am. No, from... we'd love to come down there. <laughs> I am from India. Yeah. Very you good. are. Oh. Very good. I am from Bangalore. 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 Yeah. Uh, I I okay. stay in Gujarat. You know, dry state uh, like Gandhi's yeah, place. Yes, I know. I speak Gujarati. It's my mother tongue. So. Yeah. Is it like okay? Yeah. We should uh, share. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll post it in the chat, uh, sure. and you can do the same. Sure. We should be in, the, in touch. Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. That's awesome. Okay, uh, I'm going to go ahead and do the official start here. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Chris Douglas. I am your genial host. Unfortunately, my uh, lovely co-host Brian Smith is not here, so I have to do all the driving. I count on him to do the admitting people from the waiting room so I can focus on hosting and chatting up with everyone, but uh, I'll, I'll take care of all of it today. Um, I've just put in the chat uh, some links for you. This uh, unstated meeting is hosted by Virginia Research Lodge, number 1777 of Highland Springs, Virginia. Uh, hosted under the Grand, we're under the Grand Lodge of Virginia, AFAM. Uh, the links you see is to our Facebook group, which is where most of our business is conducted for online things. You're welcome to join us. If you're on Facebook, you're welcome to come join us. Um, the next is our website where we host all of our papers and we have information on um, what other research lodges meet in the state of Virginia. A lot of information. Um, 
and uh, we host all of our papers there. And some other things, there's quite a few things I've put in there over the years. Like I can't remember everything I've got up in there. I do have a, um, I'm, I do have a link to a list of all of the lodges in Virginia with their websites and Facebook. I keep that current every year, as well as all of the grand lodges around the world and Supreme Councils. I think I have most of them. I started working on Amity and linking them all to who recognized each other and kind of gave up because it was just entirely too much work. Uh, but <laughs> but it's uh, there's a lot of good stuff there um, it's for you to check out. Next is our YouTube channel, uh, Cigar Doug, that's me. I already had a YouTube channel when we started doing this, so I just host all of my videos there, Masonic and otherwise, but uh, so that way there's one place for everyone to go look. Um, all of our meetings are recorded and they do appear there, usually before the next one anyway. I try to get to it within a week. And then my email address. Um, we have, uh, since we're a research lodge, we do have research papers that we publish we post them on the website, we post them on Facebook, and uh, I do email them out. So if you're interested in getting on the email list, you can message me on Facebook or send me an email. I'll be happy to add you. Uh, but that's every single week for two years running now, uh, we've been publishing research papers. Let's see, uh, Brother Robert, his iPhone joined us. I assume Robert's on the end of it. Good to have you with us, Robert. <laughs> And um, I wanted to, uh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Brother Randy couldn't be here this week. Brother Randy had a great talk at our last meeting about um, sacred spaces. So uh, I'm trying to, I'm trying to take this to another level. I'm not sure what that level is. We, we, we kind of talk around it from time to time, um, but we're going to try to adopt some different things and see what works here. But I want just everybody to take a minute I'm going to mute everybody. All right. I want every single one of you, we're going to take a minute. I want you to close your eyes and I want you to take four deep breaths. That's to help us center, focus on the task at hand. Um, I did mention in the last meeting that um, it's funny because I, I feel like I'm just kind of rambling, but I can't really articulate what I'm trying to do, but Randy's talk really helped kind of move in that direction is I'm looking to build a sacred space here. I'm looking to build something among us, this community of brothers who come together for these meetings to learn more about masonry and spend time with each other and have fraternal, fraternal relations and all, but also kind of build sort of a community of sorts. So I sat down and actually did a, uh, a little brainstorm in my what I was trying to say. So I'll present that at a future meeting, kind of try and get all my thoughts in one place so I can express it clearly and not sound like I'm just rambling uh, to you all. But uh, I do promise I'll have something coming on that. But it just, we have a unique experience here. I've been on other Zoom meetings and this camaraderie we have here, it seems like it, it's, it's moving towards something. I'm not sure what that something is. So we'll continue to explore that. Um, we do a lot of esoteric stuff on here. We have some stuff about alchemy. We're exploring different aspects of uh, the Masonic experience, things that I think are, I'll, I'll give you one tidbit that I came across when I was brainstorming is the ancient Masons, we believe that Masonry is not just a bunch of stone Masons who got together and wanted to have a way that they could prove that they were proficient so they could get paid more. There was more to it than just simply a trade union of sorts. It wouldn't have persisted all these centuries if it was just about operative masons being able to, because they couldn't have a master electrician card uh, authorized by the state. They had to go to another place and prove who they were so they could get on board without being an apprentice again. I think there's more to it. Uh, I've read a lot of different Masonic scholars who said that the early masons were tuned into something. They had knowledge, ancient knowledge that they had pulled together and they wanted to share it and continue to pass that knowledge along from generation to generation. And masonry was the conduit in which they passed that ancient knowledge along. And I honestly think that we in the modern world as modern day masons, it's a social organization. And there's not to knock any of the things that we do that's not esoteric, but 
the things that we're we're doing in most lodges are focused on the social aspect the brotherhood the charity and all of that has value but there's a deeper there's something deeper behind that that i think most masons don't get to plug into and i want to try and find a way to plug into that and, and take advantage of that and explore that so um i'm gonna go around real quick uh brother a day just joined us good to have you with us brother I'm going to ask uh, a couple of questions before we get to our speaker. Um, we're just going to run around. I'm going to ask every single one of you just answer the question. So you get your choice. Two questions and you pick one. What was the best thing you ever served at a Masonic function? Or what was the worst thing you were ever served at a Masonic function? So we're just going to go around Brother Tarani. You're first. Uh Okay, I think the worst thing ever that was served in the Masonic function, and it's not a thing per se, is that we once over ordered and we had an excess of sandwiches and an excess of prime rib. And it was not very, a bad problem. Yeah, so <laughs> we, we gave everybody uh, their uh, stuff to take home, and uh, yeah, it was just like a bastage. Okay, uh, Brother Griffith. The worst or the best thing you had at the Sonic function? Well, to me, the worst thing is uh, hot dogs. <laughs> okay. Get enough of them as it is. Okay. And then, uh, so uh, when I became Worshipful Master this year, um, I haven't had hot dogs. <laughs> okay, very good. Uh, Brother Clark, need to unmute. Need to unmute, brother. You need to unmute. <laughs> He's trying to figure it out. Okay, we'll come back to him in a second. Uh, Brother Bon, worst food or best food you've ever had served at a Masonic function? The the best or the worst? Okay, the best. If your choice or both. If you got both, that's fine. Oh yeah, the best one I think is that when I uh, uh, yeah. we have this reception. Um, I uh, cook some uh, pancit of lumpia, mm -hmm. Filipino foods. Oh, but I know. And I, I know serve well. to all white people inside the lodge because mm -hmm. I was I was the only mm -hmm. Filipino, and they were they were so happy about uh, eating those because I cook it with with passion and heart. Very good. Like when I serve the country, the the lodge. The okay. bad was that when we had a some kind of cookout. I burned that hamburger patties because I was, I was looking at it, but I was, in my mind, I was memorizing. Ah, <laughs> yes. Uh, so I have Easy. two fun brain functions. I'm physical and mental, but most Absolutely. of it, it was my mental thing because I was memorizing the third degree lecture. <laughs> Very good. And we have uh, 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 an event, uh, a degree next week. So the following week, I mean, so there mm -hmm. you are. That's the bad. And I serve it. And they said, what kind of ham grip of bad is this? Days? Who cooked this? <laughs> I said, I am. Oh, no wonder you're Filipino. You don't know how to cook hamburger patties. But <laughs> yeah, but that was only a joke. That was not a racist thing because it's a brother's I, kind of thing, you know. Absolutely. Up, so. so that's the bad. That's Thank all you. I could share. Thank I, you. Brother Clark, get yourself off of mute. Uh, <laughs> the worst or the best you've had? The best? Corned beef and cabbage, the worst, hot dogs and sauerkraut. No hot dog roll, just hot dog and sauerkraut. Oh, my. Okay. Uh, Brother Hughes. Well, the best are in the uh, delivery halls in London, where it's a, a full gourmet feast. Reception drinks of champagne and paired wines. Oh, okay. You got a bad? Okay. Um, Brother Baxter. The best Masonic food you ever had at a Masonic event or the worst? Or both if you have both. Brother Baxter, you're muted if you're talking. Okay, welcome back. Uh, brother Day, nice to see you, brother. What's the worst or the best food you've had at a Masonic function? You're muted. 
Okay. Um, there you are. Uh, for the lodge, where there's one night where you know we have a chilling cow. Some are really good, and some are horrible. And at the end, the best one uh, gets a prize. So it's the night where you taste different things. Oh. But you taste the best ones and you taste the worst ones too. So very good. Yeah. Uh, Brother Baxter messaged me. I'm sorry, your, his laptop's not working. His camera and mic aren't working, but uh, hot dogs worst, roast beef best. So, so pretty much we all agreed. Hot dogs are not something to be served in a Masonic function. Uh, Brother Manan. Yeah, thank you. Uh, see, we have a, a my, my, my mother lodge has uh, some different rules, let's say, regarding food, because some are changed. Jains are the uh, people, a community of a religion uh, who do not even eat onions and uh, uh, garlic. Okay. So for them, uh, pure vegetarian food without onion and garlic is served. For others, like me, myself being a vegetarian, uh, it's okay with onions. And uh, uh, other people who choose to have meat or uh, sometimes fish, they do, but in general, everyone agrees from uh, from my fraternity, uh, from my lodge, is uh, the Christmas pudding we have during the installation, mm -hmm. which is generally in the December, and uh, um, uh, every dessert, uh, every dessert at the end of every uh, month. So is, that's the best. Is good or bad? Or best? Okay, good. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. People are bouncing around and the participants not sure. Okay, Brother Robert, Robert's iPhone. I can see you if you want to unmute. Tell me the worst or the best food you've had at a Masonic function. You're muted. You're muted, Robert. All right, welcome back to Robert. Rooster. Oh, there he is. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Robert. Now you're unmuted. The best and the worst. It was kind of combination. Oh, hey, um, I know that guy. That's my senior warden. <laughs> <laughs> brother Chuck Bronson. Good to have you here, brother. Robert. Robert Bronson. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Robert. Well, Rooster, okay. I decided you're Chuck Bronson now. Okay. Well, um, there's a Chuck Brinson Bronson um, brother, too. Okay. But, um, uh, the wor the best, the worst and best, I'd say, um, it was, I hadn't been a Mason for maybe about 10, for about five years. It was before I went in the East. Um, we went to this um, lodge in DC and it was an, it was a, it was a Prince Hall Mason lodge in DC. And we were told we were going to eat but during the, at the before the lodge, well, we got there at five o'clock. They weren't going to serve us until eleven o'clock at night. Oh None man! None of us had eaten right at all, and so finally they had this um, huge meal: fish, ribeye, the whole thing. And we were in there till about four in the morning. Oh my gosh! <laughs> <laughs> eating. <laughs> Needless I to say, the driver did stayed sober the, while the rest of us didn't oh my <laughs> excellent i, I just I, I didn't realize robert that was you because you didn't answer me when i called you the first time this is the first brethren we have all three stationed officers of virginia research lodge on the call at the same time rooster's the worshipful master robert here is senior warden and i'm junior warden that's a first i think i don't think we normally have more than two officers on here period but we have all three stationed officers here we could actually open a meeting if we had to so that's great. I'm glad to have you here, Robert. <laughs> it's good to be here. <laughs> you, you've been on once or twice before. I'm not. Yes. Individually, people. Have, and John London, our marshal, normally pops in over his phone. Never on video. I was just on his phone. But he, he's a regular attendee. But uh, I keep chiding my beloved uh, brothers in Research Lodge and saying, you know, I got people all over the world can make it to one of these meetings. And I can't get you guys in this room to show up for a meeting. So I don't know what's going on. But I'm. I will keep gently chiding you all and see if I can buck up attendance from us at our own meetings. I think it's only fair. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> all right. Uh, Brother Rooster, let's go to you. What uh, best or worst food at a Masonic function? Well, me being from the South 
ain't no bad food, ain't no good food. It's all the same. I like okay. it all. I'm hungry. I'm going to eat it. Uh, that's a bit of a cop out, but we'll let it go because you're the master. Uh, Steven Spence. Let's see. Yes, uh, from you. Uh, Brother Chris, uh, Brother Rooster, that sounds like a good idea. I don't think I've really had anything uh, terrible, luckily, up here in Ontario, Canada, south. But um, uh, the best was uh, we had the Rebecca's ladies of the um, Odd Fellows. Uh, cook for us a couple of years ago and they made the homemade roast beef, mashed potatoes, some vegetables and then homemade pie so I tell you the whole district knew about it after that mm. so uh, that's the real thing that attracts it to my little country lodge is the home cooked meal from the Rebecca ladies thank you brother that's, that's awesome Okay, well, I, I, I've been racking my brains trying to find a good one. I guess not a lot of them stand out in my memory, but I'm going to go with, um, as far as good, um, we had a Chevalier dinner. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Demolays, but I'm the, um, the commander of our um, Chevalier court here in Tidewater, and I had the privilege of hosting the most recent Chevalier observance dinner back in November, and I had a good buddy of mine who was a member of my lodge serve barbecue. And he made an outstanding, uh, we had ribs, uh, we had chicken, we had sausage, uh, we had pulled pork. It was just incredible. In fact, it was, it was a bit too much food. I probably would have left off the ribs. I would have cut down on the price because I barely broke even as it was, uh, just charging $20 a head. But that was probably the best dinner I have, but it was one that I put together myself. So go figure. Um, the worst, I will say the worst, it was a... Grandmaster's official visit to District 35 A and B at the time, which is my area, Norfolk, Virginia area. We had whatever the dinner they prepared. We had over 400 people show up, and they they budgeted for around 300 some. And it happens; it's not your fault. They had to have to run out and get Domino's pizza to feed the last 20 people because they ran out of the chicken or whatever it was they were serving. That can happen. I don't remember the dinner. What I remember was the dessert. The dessert was this red, white, and blue jello something, but it was like layers, red, white, and blue. It was absolutely tasteless. I mean, <laughs> you ate this and you put your spoon in and it's like you tasted your spoon. You could not, whatever it was, it wasn't that it was bad. You literally could not taste this gelatin that they made. There was absolutely no flavor, but it was three different levels of colors of no flavor. It was the most bizarre thing. <laughs> and we're still, that was at least 10 years ago. And we still talk about the red, white, and blue jello you couldn't taste. Um, one more story since we brought up Filipino food. We have Virginia Research, or, sorry, Victory Daylight Lodge, number 1778, which is one off from us. Uh, they're here in our district. Well, actually, they just moved to the beach, but they used to be in our district. They meet on Saturdays. And they became primarily a Filipino lodge. We have several lodges in the area. There's a lot, as more and more Filipino brothers join, they tend to congregate. And I must say my Filipino brothers are much better at bringing in Masons because those lodges are growing. But when they had a raising on a Saturday morning, the brother would have to host a meal afterwards. We had three raisings one day. And this is back when I was running around uh, doing a lot of ritual work for other lodges because my lodge at the time wasn't busy. So I go to Victory Daylight every Saturday because they let me fill in and do a lecture, do senior deacon, do whatever. So they did three raisins on one day and then all three brothers had their wives get together and they had a huge feast at one of their houses. We had more food, every kind of food you can imagine. And I remember looking around and all the different, you know, you just kind of go around to the buffet and you look at things and it's like, well, what is this? And all my Filipino brothers are like, oh, that's a, that's chocolate beef. Try the chocolate beef. You'll like the chocolate beef. You know, go ahead. So, yes. So I had a, a helping of this stuff that looked kind of like pudding. So I ate some of this nice uh, chocolate beef. And afterwards, like, okay, what was that really? Like, oh, well, there's some, there's some cow blood in there. No big deal. <laughs> but it's a blood pudding. So that was that was fun. The, the chocolate beef. They all had a good laugh at my expense. So yeah, the, you, cow, you blood, the, the that, cow blood makes you intelligent more as a mason. 
Oh, good. Well, then <laughs> I, I grew smarter that day because I had a nice helping of chocolate beef. I always remember that. Well, that was fun. I think I got everybody there. Um, I will say that we had a, I, I, I'm trying all kinds of different things here, as you may notice. Um, sometimes we have speakers, sometimes we have panels, and I really like the panel discussions. I tried to do this thing, which I called Masonic Mania, and both times we did it, it flopped. We barely had anybody attending. But the idea was that I drew up a list of questions and I was just going to, the whole meeting was going to be, I'm just asking questions like this of everybody in the room. And it didn't go over. So I don't know what it was. People don't know what, they didn't recognize the, I had a picture of a steel cage because I was doing a, a riff on um, uh, WrestleMania, which is popular here in the US. And, you know, it was like Masonic Mania. So I guess like it appear to translate well. Well, for whatever reason, those flops, so I'm not going to do another one. So I just thought I'm just going to pull out a few of these questions and just ask like one or two at the beginning of our meeting. It's not going to be the whole meeting because this is what I want is this is more fun. So rather than have a whole meeting like this, where that was the focus, I guess I'll just sort of trick you all and just sort of put out these questions one or two at a time. And I think that's more fun. That way we're not spending the whole meeting on it. But I do. I did come up with a lot of fun questions and I want to ask them, but it just seemed like when that was the focus of the meeting, it flopped. So I do learn from my mistakes <laughs> and I'm trying to find different different formats to try here because we're online. We can do whatever the heck we want. This isn't a formal meeting. We can try different formats. Um, so you expect to see more things along the way as I get ideas. If any of you have ideas about something you want us to try here at these meetings, please just forward it along to me and we'll give it a go and see what works. Bye. So I have uh, taken enough of everybody's time. I want to go ahead and introduce Brother Tirani. I'll ask him to introduce himself and give all of his bio because we don't normally bother gathering. In a well-run program, I would have his whole bio in front of me and I'd read it and tell you all about him. But honestly, um, I'd rather just have him tell us what he wants to tell. He don't have to mention every single Masonic thing he's in, just whatever he thinks the highlights are. But uh, Brother Tirani is our guest speaker. So thank you, thank Brother you. Tirani, and take it away. Thank you, Chris. And my bio would be really short. Uh, I mean, uh, masonry runs in my family in, back in India. And uh, I'm a member and a junior steward, a junior steward of uh, St. Andrew's Lodge, number 16 here in Toronto. Our lodge uh, will be completing 200 years this year. One of the, the, it's rare to find anything that's 200 years old in Canada. Uh, I'm also, I also belong to Ramesi's uh, Shriners and I'm the education chair of my lodge and uh, I uh, do quite a bit of education work in my district, Toronto Dawn Valley District. And that's about it. Okay, you go ahead and start with your presentation whenever you're ready. Okay, I'm um, just going to minimize this and can everybody see the screen? Can you see not yet. Screen? Yeah. Okay. Not yet. No. Not yet. Nope. Uh, can you see the screen now? Yep. You're good to go. Okay. Uh, so I, you know, if anybody has any questions, or I'd really like this to be more conversational. Uh, uh, so it's not, it's very casual over here. If anybody has any questions or any comments at any point in time, feel free to inter interrupt me. And uh, if you have trouble understanding my accent, I know uh, Manon won't because I'm also from India. Uh, so if you guys have any trouble understanding my accent, just feel free to stop me at any point in time. So what we're going to talk about today is Shatter Cathedral. And we're going to see how Shatter Cathedral serves as a repository of sacred knowledge. It's a build, it's a basically an encyclopedia of sacred knowledge in stone. And uh, as an example, let me just, sorry. Let's look at the Great Pyramid, shall we? Just as an example of what we're, what we're trying to do over here. This is the Great Pyramid. And the coordinates of the Great Pyramid are 29 degrees, 97 minutes, 299792 
0.458. This, these digits represent the speed of light. And this, the speed of light was only uh, figured out in the 16th century by observing the phases of the moons of Jupiter. However, this secret has been hidden here in plain sight for all those who have eyes to see and uh, uh, for 4,000 years. But people just don't realize it because people are not aware or they don't really take, uh, take the time to look. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look deeper into, uh, <clears throat> into Chartres Cathedral and see what sort of secrets are hidden in plain sight. I wanted to give you another example. This is the Golden Gate Bridge. I have driven on it so many times. I've driven on it like I lived in California in the, the Bay, Bay Area, and I've driven on it maybe a hundred times, but never did I stop to ask myself, like the other millions of people have, who have driven on it, I never stopped to ask myself, hey man, why is it called the Golden Gate Bridge? It's neither golden, nor is it a gate. The term Golden Gate derives from ancient Egypt. And San Francisco is a city steeped in Masonic and ancient Egyptian symbolism. The Golden Gate is the gate that souls pass through on their way to the Duat. And that is uh, watched over by uh, the god Osiris. And the Silver Gate uh, is the gate that souls pass to enter this uh, uh, physical uh, body. And that's watched over by his consort, Isis. So this, uh, I just wanted to give you guys a flavor of what we're trying to do here in this presentation. Uh, so any questions, comments, feel free to stop me at any point in time. Okay. Now let's go. I have one. Yeah, this is Bond. That was a, a very interesting feature that you gave. Where did you get that? Uh, uh, the coordinates. Uh, the coordinate what reference. What source did you get that reference? Uh, you can do it yourself. Go to Google Earth and uh, mm -hmm. find the coordinate of the King's Chamber within the within the Great Pyramid, and you will find those exact same coordinates. Got it, my brother. Thank you so much. Yeah. The Great Pyramid is uh, spread out over several acres, so uh, the coordinates will vary slightly. But if you look at the King's Chamber, and that's a misnomer because no body, the King's Chamber, the term is a misnomer because no body has ever been found within, within the pyramid. Um, historians, traditional historians say that, oh, the pyramids was just tombs. Were they really? There's no body ever been found within the Great Pyramids. They are a few miles away in the Valley of the Kings. Excuse me, brother, uh, just to answer that question, because I was wondering about that myself. The position of the Pyramid of Giza is 29.9792 degrees north, and then it's 31 degrees east. So it's the latitude and longitude. It's only one of those points. It's the um, latitude is uh, 29.9792 degrees. And then the speed of light in meters is... 299,792,000. So that's where it coordinates. It's the the latitude, which is the first of the latitude and longitudes, is yeah. the position. And then they met. Yeah, I, when I saw that meme myself, it's like, but that's only one direction. Yes. But now, it, it does but, correspond. Yes. Yes. If and that answers brother's, uh, Brother Bob's question. And the latitude is the only absolute. Because if you divide a circle, uh, the, the longitude can be derived from only the green, Greenwich uh, meridian. Oh, I see. Right. You I see. We pick an arbitrary point, whereas the equator is the equator no matter where the you The north. Are. No matter where. It starts from zero. Excellent point. It, isn't that the, like the, uh, the uh, form of the lodge, which is the north um, chair, is always dark? Is that what also derived? I don't know. I'm thinking ahead, I guess, with that north latitude. 
I'm not so sure. Correct me if I am wrong. I, I'm just, you know, throwing that out because I always remember the North. North is always the dark side of the lodge. Oh, what that, the, the meaning for that, brother, is um, <clears throat> when they built King Solomon's temple, because of the position of the temple in, in, in being where it was in, in, in Israel, um, no matter whether it was the sun or the moon, no matter what was shining, you you never had a ray of light reaching the northernmost part of Solomon's temple. Got it. So that's why it was a place of darkness. So no matter what time of day it was, no matter when they were working at night, when there was light from the sun or light from the moon, the northernmost part of the temple was always in darkness. And it's funny because the, 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 the lecture says uh, so far north of the ecliptic, but it's like, honestly, Jerusalem is not that far away from the, but I guess most of our countries are, north, most of us are north of the equator. I don't think of Jerusalem as being that far north of the equator, but, but it is. Uh, so if, if Solomon's temple had been built in the middle of Africa along the equator, um, the sun would have shined directly in and filled the entire room with light. But because it's to the north, the sun can't reach the northernmost part of the, uh, of the structure. So that's where that came from. That's right. Thank you. Uh, so let's go to Chartres Cathedral. Let's go to Medi uh, let's go to France. Um, Chartres Cathedral was the first uh, cathedral dedicated to Our Lady, to Notre Dame, to Mary. Uh, uh, the site of Chartres Cathedral has always been uh, since a hundred years, uh, since one hundred BC. The site of uh, Chartres Cathedral has hosted the temple <clears throat> to the Virgin. Um, a pagan temple to the Virgin. And uh, uh, Chateau Cathedral, the place, uh, the site of Chateau Cathedral has hosted a church ever since uh, 600 odd, uh, I don't know what the exact AD is, but ever since uh, the Gauls converted to uh, Christianity, uh, Chateau Cathedral has always hosted a church over there. The earlier churches were wooden churches. And uh, Chart is an example of uh, Gothic architecture. It's the, one of the first earliest examples of Gothic architecture, and it became a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1977, I think, I'm not sure, but somewhere around there. Um, Chartres is also a major pilgrimage uh, uh, spot for uh, Christians worldwide because Chartres hosts the Sancta Camisa. That is the tunic that is supposedly worn by uh, Mary at Christ's birth. You can go there to this day and you can see the, uh, see the uh, part of the tunic on display. Now, when the old church, the wooden church burnt down, the relic was feared lost. But when it was discovered unharmed in the ruins, that sparked an interest in the building project in Europe. And uh, Chartres became the first uh, cathedral dedicated to Notre Dame, like I mentioned. A powerful partnership. So our story starts in 1118. Nine self-described poor knights of Christ have just returned home to France. And they have spent a decade excavating, digging, under the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. These nine poor knights later became the Templars. And they entered into a partnership with this man. He was the, great, he was the greatest preacher of his time and he wrote several books on the Virgin Mary. He is St. Bernard of Clairvaux. And uh, he was the most uh, influential uh, uh, author, uh, Christian author during his time. He wrote several books on Mary and he said, no one can enter heaven except through Mary. Over here uh, on the right, we see him receiving milk from the virgin's breast. Now it is important to understand that the Virgin Mary was a minor figure in Christian worship. And it's only with the coming of uh, uh, St. Bernard 
and his writings and the rise of emotional Christianity in the 11th and 12th century did Mary take a central role. She became the prime intercessor between us and God. If you want something from God, you need to petition Mary. And that's what uh, St. Bernard wrote about and that's what he emphasized. St. Bernard had a tremendous impact on, uh, on Gothic architecture. In his uh, book uh, uh, on building, he said, there should be no decoration, only proportion. Uh, what do you mean by proportion? Proportion means sacred geometry. This is Christ uh, above the door of Chartres Cathedral. I know uh, Chris posted this in uh, Facebook as uh, the introduction to the talk today. Christ uh, emerges from a vesica Pisces. A vesica Pisces is created when two circles uh, intersect in a, in a way such that their circumference uh, sits on each other's center. Christ is surrounded by the four beasts of the apocalypse. Uh, they could also be the four uh, evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And all the cathedrals built in the Gothic, sty Gothic style have taken inspiration from St. Bernard. And they are all full of sacred geometry all throughout. This uh, Chartres Cathedral is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, like I mentioned, and it's a beautiful building. I have not had the opportunity to go there myself. I've seen a lot of the other churches and cathedrals in, uh, in Europe. We just couldn't make it on that day to uh, Chartres. Now, the question is, I was, while I was researching this, I started wondering, man, how did they get these heavy blocks of stone up to this height? How did they do it? I mean, hundreds of feet in the air. They must have had some sort of system. And they actually did. Now, the newest member of the stonemason's lodge would be made to run like a hamster within the wheel. You can see the wheel over here. And he would, his job would be to walk, walk the wheel keep walking the wheel and slowly lift the blocks of stone up to the great height that they were needed. And I just thought it was really interesting and uh, maybe that's what we should do to uh, all the new uh, initiates in our lodge, we're considering it right now, but, <laughs> but I just wanted to show you that this is how they actually did it. They would put, uh, they would create a big hamster wheel and a pulley system. And uh, the newest uh, member of the stonemason's lodge would spend whole day walking like a hamster in the wheel, and he would slowly lift the blocks of stone up to the desired height. Now, you might say, okay, this is just the cathedral builders. They were different from the Templars and they're different from the Freemasons. What's the connection over here? So I just put this up right front in the presentation. Is there a connection between the cathedral builders, the Templars and the Freemasons? What do you think, brother? Do you think we are cut from the same cloth with the same people wearing different hats? Uh, Chris mentioned in the beginning that, you know, the builders of the cathedrals and they were not just stonemasons uh, trying to prove, uh, 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 prove their worth uh, to other stonemasons. They were, they had secret knowledge within themselves, within them, uh, within the order. And that secret knowledge has transferred to the Templars and transferred to the Freemasons. But is there a connection here? Let's see if we can actually make a connection. So this is Bouge Cathedral. This was built around the same time as Chartres Cathedral. And it's only 100 kilometers away from Chartres Cathedral. And this, of course, is Rosslyn Chapel. And Rosslyn Chapel is well documented to be built by a faction of the Templars who escaped the raid on their order in 1307, and they fled north to Scotland. Now let's try to connect these two buildings, shall we? Let us go to Google Earth 
and actually draw a line from the front door of Bush's Cathedral to the front door of Rosslyn Chapel. And let's just see what happens. From the front door of Rosslyn Chapel to the front door of Bush Cathedral, quite shockingly, the line passes through London. And not only does it pass through London, the line, the axis, the Bourge, uh, Rosslyn Chapel axis intersects the Grand Lodge, United Grand Lodge of England at a 90 degree angle. Incontrovertibly proving, incontrovertibly proving the connection between the cathedral builders, the Templars and the Freemasons. I can just imagine the amount of planning that went into making this uh, possible. What, um, okay, what is the significance of Burgess Cathedral? I mean, there are several cathedrals in Europe. What is the specific? Well, Burgess Cathedral was one of the earliest cathedrals built and they were sort of built by the same builders of Chart Cathedral around the same time. Okay, okay. Yeah. And so that would have been built when? Burgess Cathedral? Um, I'm not very good with dates, uh, Chris. Okay. But you can look it up. It was built Rough, in okay. well, I mean, I can do 12, 12 uh, change, 12 and change. 12, and then Roslyn Chapel? Roslyn Chapel was built, I think, around 1400s, maybe. I don't know. Right. And then the United the Grand Lodge. The site, the United Grand Lodge has been uh, the. The site of United Grand Lodge has been there since 1717, I think. Well, and that's what it was. I mean, the Grand Lodge was founded in 1717. I don't know when they built the actual, but we'll say in the 1700s. So just to make it clear to everyone, Borgia's Cathedral was built in, finished in 1230. And then I'm Googling, Roslyn Chapel was built next, which was 1446. 200 some years later. And then Grand Lodge. Um, the site was chosen yeah. earlier though. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know if I have any English masons on here. But no. uh, oh, Freemasons Hall. Is yep. that that's Freemasons Hall? That's that Freemason. was built in 1927. Much yeah, later, but, but the site was chosen much, much earlier. Oh, I, I don't deny. I'm sure there's significance when they chose it, but yeah, yeah. And this is quite uh, interesting to do in Google Earth. I, I, I actually wanted to do it here live, mm -hmm. but you know, I'm just like terrible at using uh, Google Earth and you know, oh, to align. This it is much. Bit. No, this is much simpler. You, you, I, I'd rather not watch you sit on the screen and try and draw something. <laughs> it's much easier to show the end product, believe me, yeah. as someone who does presentations all the time. But that yeah. is, now, okay, you could, I mean, just play devil's advocate. It, it, well, the fact is that there is a line between Roslyn Chapel and Burgess Cathedral, and the <laughs> fact that it runs through London probably influenced them to build Mason's Hall when they built, since it was built last. Hello, I'm sorry to interject. Sorry to interject. But uh, with the different years that was built of all these cathedrals, I assume um, that the Templars did all these things during those particular centuries because the Templars were all the, uh, the most uh, money, or more powerful and more influential at that time beside the kings. That's my thought about it. Um, yeah, uh, so my wife has always wondered, you know, when we went to visit uh, United Grand Lodge, uh, she was wondering, why is it at such a weird angle in the street? Like, you know, it's just, it's just at a weirdly placed. And the reason why is so that the line, the access from Borgia to Rosalind Chapel would intersect it at a right angle. And that's the only reason why I could think it was built in this way. So you can right. see the 1717 on it. That but, is the formation of the Grand Lodge. And I think the site was chosen much earlier than the actual building itself. And this is the third building on the site, I think, if I'm not mistaken. 
but I mean, in, in all fairness, the, the I don't doubt that the Freemasons Hall was built specifically to follow along that line. I'm just saying the, the creation of the Burgess Cathedral and um, Roslyn Chapel being built where they were, they weren't built in anticipation of Freemasons Hall, is what I'm no. saying. But no. but now, as I think it was sacred spaces where Brother Johnson was talking about, there are, man, I'm, I, I'm, I'm butchering what he said, he said it much better, but there are um, certain magnetic points. There are certain points in our magnetic field around the earth that are stronger in certain locations than others in the world. Stonehenge, for example, is located at one of these points. I, I'm not doing justice to what he said, but basically yeah. <clears throat> there are points around the earth where the magnetic field, they coincide or they're stronger, they come together at certain points and yeah. everywhere that anything of significance is built, he was talking about sacred spaces, um, anywhere there's something of prominence that we look to as this is significant, where the, where the pyramids were built, where Stonehenge is, where um, Chicken, Itza, Chicken Itza and other um, structures built in Mexico and Latin America, all of these were along these fault lines where there was a stronger energy. They what call it ley lines in England. Ley lines, that's it. Thank you. I, I was butchering the name. <laughs> so these ley lines exist throughout the world. I'd be willing to bet if you check, all three of these buildings are found along these ley lines. So there is some. So it, now understand that even as early as the 1920s, when this was built, it's certainly much easier for a modern day architect or designer to say, here's Roslyn Chapel, here's Burgess Cathedral, I want to draw Freemasons Hall along that line. That's an easier feat to accomplish in the 1900s than it would be in, say, the 1200s. Would you not agree? But clearly the people who built Borges Cathedral knew that was a ley line. That was a significant place to start, even in the 13th century, which is of more, that's more credible to me than the fact that the Freemasons Hall said, well, we're going to lie. It, it, was a, it was a taller order for them to figure out than it would be for us in the 20th century to figure it out. That's my point. Absolutely. <laughs> <clears throat> Absolutely. I don't disagree with anything you said. Uh, and that's worth an investigation. Uh, the ley lines, uh, that theory is worth an investigation, definitely. Uh, let's just to move on because I have like 60 odd slides here. <laughs> so the two towers. Now, the right tower in uh, Chartres Cathedral is called the Sun Tower. Now, why is it the Sun Tower? It's 365 feet high, 365 being an obvious solar reference to the solar cycle. And the right tower is called the moon tower. That's only 337 feet high. But 365 minus 337 is 28, which alludes to the cycle of the moon around the earth. The lunar cycle is 28 days long. Now, where do we see this represented in Masonic lodges? very obviously in the two pillars uh, in front of uh, King Solomon's temple. The right pillar represents the sun and the left pillar represents the moon. Now this is a much older idea though. It's much older. Uh, like in the ruins of Ka at Karnak, the two obelisks stood at the, uh, at the entrance of, uh, of uh, the temples. All the temples in Egypt always had two obelisks in the right side and the left side of the, uh, of the entrance of the temple. So I know King Solomon's uh, temple had, uh, had Boaz and Jaqin there, but the idea is much older. Why Pythagoras? So in the facade of Chartres Cathedral, they're all scenes from the Bible. There's the apostles shown and there's uh, stories from the Bible depicted. 
but somehow they hit Pythagoras. The builders of Shah Kishiro hid Pythagoras right in the facade. Why would they hide Pythagoras? I mean, what's the significance? Why would, what does Pythagoras have got to do with anything? The Pythagoreans were a secret order dedicated to the worship of, num of number. And Pythagoras himself said, all is number. Shatu Cathedral was not only just a place of worship, it was also a cathedral school. As it was one of the first Gothic cathedrals built, people came to Chartres Cathedral to learn the art of cathedral building. And here the seven liberal arts were taught. The uh, four uh, arts uh, are the quadrivium and uh, the trivium. You need the trivium in order to understand the uh, quadrivium. Trivium is, the word, is where we get the word trivial from. And Chartres, there was a school, there was, a, uh, there was an architectural school of Chartres Cathedral. So people came here from all over Europe. They learned the seminal liberal arts, they learned cathedral building, and then they spread that knowledge all across Europe. And the partnership between the Templars and the church started one of the greatest building projects humanity has ever undertaken, the building of the Gothic cathedrals. Over the next 300 years, Cathedrals sprang up all over Europe. And these cathedrals are not easy to build. And it's considered one of the greatest uh, uh, building projects in all of human, uh, all of, uh, human history. Temple to man. Uh, Vitruvius, the Roman uh, architectural historian, if you want to call him that, in his 10 books of architecture, he wrote that all effective temples are based on the proportions of the human body. And you can find this right at the temple of Hathor. You can find it in um, uh, Indian temples. Uh, so let's see how Shatra represents the human body. <clears throat> this is the floor plan of Shatra Cathedral. Uh, it's laid out ad quadratum or by the square. The smaller squares are half the size of the larger squares, just as um, octaves are related in music. And this proportion matches the proportion of the human body. This is uh, the Vitruvian man as created by Cesar, uh, uh, Cesariano, uh, a prominent uh, Renaissance uh, thinker and painter. And the the, the, the floor plan of Chartres is laid out as the proportions of the human body are. There's also a surprising connection to the Hindu world. In the 1970s, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the main researchers of uh, Chartres Cathedral, who had written the book, I can't remember the name of the book right now, Chartres Cathedral, a Sacred Geometry, he was approached by a Hindu gentleman who pointed out that the main uh, the main points uh, the, such as on the on the cathedral facade such as the rose window the Christ above the door the door itself this is laid out as per the proportions of the chakras in Hinduism the human body is divided into chakras or, the, or energy points. And he said, this exactly matches the chakras of the human body. And the floor plan also matches the chakras of the human body. Wow. The chakras actually correspond to, correspond, correspond to, the, uh, uh, to the glands, the pituitary gland. Uh, that's the crown chakra. The uh, third eye chakra is the pineal gland. The throat chakra is the thyroid gland. So any questions? comments at this point. So this is a surprising connection uh, uh, that, you know, how did the cathedral builders actually know this? Next, we come to the I, If I could just to make a comment on that, I'm trying to formulate my words here. Um, 
the impression I get from most of Christianity is if you bring up any other religions, any other spiritual thoughts, it's like, well, that's wrong. Jesus is the only way that's it. All of that is wrong. All of that is wrong, wrong, wrong. Here you see men who built this together. If that was, if that truly is not a coincidence, hard to believe that it would be a coincidence. If you go back two slides real quick. Um, so you uh -huh. see the facade of the building, the one before that, the facade of the building and the floor plan directly correspond to the chakra, chakras. I don't see how that can be a coincidence. So some, so men who are not only building a structure for a Christian cathedral, and at the time, of course, there was no Reformation. There was the Catholic Church and only the Catholic Church. If you were a Christian, you were a Catholic. So they're building this as a Catholic cathedral for God, for the Christian faith, but they incorporate a more Eastern uh, philosophy or awareness in there. That's, uh, that, that's kind of mind blowing to me. It's like, what did they know at the time? And again, to, to be clear, that's not, I'm sure if they said that to the Pope or the Cardinals or the churches, here's what we're going to build here. Yeah. They wouldn't get, they wouldn't be the ones building the cathedral after that point. <laughs> Definitely not. So they, that, that's what we would call an Easter egg these days. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna, that's a very good point, Chris. And there are other Easter eggs buried in Shatter too. You know, you'd be, you'd be, uh, you'd be really, uh, it's the last one that I have, uh, that's pretty interesting. You'll find that really interesting. Now we come to the uncomfortable question of the Black Madonna. Researchers look at the Black Madonna and look at the black marble and they say the blackness of the marble is an allusion to her North African origins. And this is actually St. Bernard. He reintroduced the cult of Isis to the West under the veil of Mary. This is a uncomfortable uh, discussion to be having, but uh, there is a lot of evidence. I mean, there, I did some research on this and there are 500 to 800 uh, black Madonna scattered throughout Europe. Now, do they all represent ISIS? I don't think so, but maybe they were built. Uh, the uh, Charter was one of the first, it was the first cathedral dedicated to Our Lady. Uh, so maybe they copied it, or maybe that was just a that that was a good building to uh, black marble was a popular building uh, material at the time. Uh, this uh, so the the black the black marble uh, alludes to Isis uh, as uh, Isis is of North African origin. She's the ancient Egyptian goddess. Let's just do a. Uh, let's just keep. Let's just entertain this theory a little bit. And Brother, uh, if I could ask, just to understand, so Saint Bernard. I think it's funny because I was thinking of the dog when I think of Saint Bernard. But uh, he was. When was he? When was he around? What time frame was he around? He was around in the in the eleventh century. Eleventh century. Okay. So I. And if there are any Catholic brothers here, maybe, I mean, not a lot of Catholics in Masonry, but there are some. If one of them can maybe fill me on this. I, I was, I've always been Protestant, so I, I only know the Catholics from afar, but I'm aware of what they do. I know that in the Catholic Church, St. Mary is a huge thing, and some people take issue with the Catholics as basically treating Mary as basically on a level with Jesus. And, and some people actually pray directly to Mary before St. Bernard, did the Catholic Church have treat Mary as divine, or was it St. Bernard who basically brought it along, where he introduced the idea? The Virgin Mary was a minor figure in Christianity. There is more on Mary in the Quran than there is in the Bible. Oh, wow. And Mary, um, like... Uh, it, the, 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 the worship of Mary started with St. Bernard and the rise of emotional Christianity in the 12th century. Okay, so before and that, the Catholic Church, just to be clear, before that, Mary was only a minor figure in the Catholic Church before St. Bernard. You are correct. Okay, okay, thank you. 
that's all. Uh, please go on. I just, I just wanted to make One sure. One of the I things understood. that, that uh, with looking back at the floor plans of the cathedrals and Pythagoras theory, and then with the Hinduism, was he not, did he not go throughout Europe and Asia to connect that? Would there not be that, um, this is Ro Brother Bronson, um, that that's why there might be Pythagoras of numbers? Pythagoras, uh, so Pythagorean thought is said to have emerged from Egypt and knowledge okay. spread from Egypt to Greece and then to Western Europe. In masonry, we say knowledge spread its benign, uh, originated in the East and spread its benign influence westward. So Pythagoras was a repository of ancient Egyptian knowledge. And uh, he served as a, uh, the cult of Pythagoras borrowed a lot of, I mean, they completely borrowed ideas from Hermetic philosophy and Hermes being taught in the Egyptian uh, uh, canon. And that spread westward. And uh, yeah, I, I'll, I have some slides on that and I'll come to that shortly. I think, if I may, I think what it is, Robert, is that the, the men who built this cathedral drew on Pythagoras as well as other sources. So Pythagoras was a, a, a source of knowledge from the East and from other places, but it looks like they, it's not like he was around to be involved in this. It's just that the work he had done they reflected his contribution as well. So they're pulling in from different sources around the world in constructing this building. Well, also, which is what's that also that it seems that the layout of a lodge, east to west, north to south, is that not some of the Pythagoras and cathedral building that go connected with that? I think so. I think I think there's definitely a connection there. I would think because so. That's when you kept showing the slides. I kept thinking, well, that's a, the way the lodge is set up. <laughs> yes, that's Pythagoras. And then, and you know, in the Master Mason degree, voila, I found it. You know that how these things worked, and that could be the connection between the Gills, the Templars, and the Freemasons. Yep. Yeah, yeah but uh, that's that's a good point. Yeah. And that just that just thought that popped in my head. You're correct. <laughs> so let's look at some of the similarities between Isis and Mary. Yeah. The location yeah. of Chartres Cathedral was always a druidic shrine of uh, a virgin worship, uh, right from 100 BC before uh, the Christian era. Both were virgins with uh, unusual conceptions, and their sons, Horus and Jesus, both. Both represent the sun. Horus and Jesus say, share the same birthday, December 25th. Both Isis and Mary share the title of Queen of Heaven. Isis being much, much older than Mary. Now, now you might ask me at this point, are you saying, okay, you know, first let's cover this. Uh, why have people since ancient times always worshipped the Virgin? This is Virgo the Virgin. She is shown lying on a side, holding a sheaf of wheat in her hand. When the sun is in Virgo, in the September time frame, that is the time to harvest the crop. And if you pray to Virgo, it is hoped that she will give you a good harvest so you will survive the winter. Now, Are you telling us that the Freemasons, the Templars, the cathedral builders, the Theosophians, all are engaged in the secret worship of Isis? There is a lot of evidence for this fact. And actually putting it into a presentation uh, would take around 50 slides. I did a lot of research on this and it's a rabbit hole. Isis is represented by two things. One is the hat the liberty hat, and the other is an exposed breast. Now let's go to the, uh, the left side. You have uh, Delacroix's uh, Liberty Leading the People. It's a French Revolution uh, painting, a very important painting. It's there in the Louvre. Here you see Liberty 
with the ISIS hat and the exposed breast, both at the same time. She is leading the people. Is this a liberty, Libertas, the goddess Libertas, is a representation of the goddess Isis. Here, the seal of the United States Senate. Once again, you see the Liberty hat, Isis's hat. The goddess Columbia, America personified as a goddess. She's wearing the Liberty hat. And here, uh, this is uh, a part of the painting, uh, part of the fresco called Apotheosis of George Washington, Apotheosis of Washington, which is in the Capitol building. We'll come to it later, but there's several crypto references to ICs. Your flora is shown with an exposed breast. Young America is shown with the ISIS hat. This is, uh, uh, this is a, a painting called uh, Genius, and, Genius and Study in the Ancient World. This actually represents Isis shown with a hat and an exposed breast. She is being, she, this is Athena, the goddess of wisdom, the Greek goddess of wisdom. Mercury or Hermes is introducing Athena to Isis, sorry. Athena to Isis. This painting symbolizes the movement of secret knowledge from the East, from Egypt to Greece. Now, this is the fountain of regeneration uh, erected in 19, 1793 uh, in the former site of the Bastille in Paris. This actually shows Isis leaking water from her breasts. Now remember the photo of uh, the painting of Saint Bernard receiving milk from the Virgin? This sort of represents uh, 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 Isis uh, uh, leaking milk from her breast. This was the fountain that was built in the site of the Bastille. Now the, the French Revolution was heavily Masonically inspired and there is a, a ton of evidence for, uh, in support of this theory. Um, this is another another uh, image of the same uh, statue, which actually shows uh, 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 the milk uh, leaking from the virgin's breast. Now we come to the connection to Freemasonry. We Freemasons call ourselves sons of the widow. Have you ever wondered who the widow is? and who the father is, and who are we supposed to be if we are actually sons of the widow? The most- Hiram Abhi. Hiram Abhi. So that is, uh, when, uh, king, uh, uh, when the king of Tyre writes to King Solomon, he says, I'm sending Hiram Abhi, the widow's son, to help you build the temple. Yep. In the lecture. Yeah, but, a lot of Masonic uh, writers point to the goddess Isis. She is the most celebrated widow of all time. Her husband, Osiris, was killed by his evil brother, Seth. And, they, and somehow she managed to uh, uh, have a child. I won't go get into the Isis uh, um, story, Isis Osiris story, but she was widowed and still managed to have a child. Horus, who grew up to be God of the Sun. We'll come to that in a minute. This is a, a pendant body of Freemasonry. This is uh, Durham, Ontario. These are right here in Ontario where I'm sitting. The Widow's Sons. Now, Isis's uh, son, Horus, grew up to become God of the Sun. Do we have any other examples of famous Freemasons becoming sun gods? If you look up at the, in the when you're in the capital, if you look up on the rotunda, you will see this painting, this fresco. It is called the Apotheosis of George Washington, which literally shows George Washington surrounded by 13 maidens representing the 13 colonies becoming a sun god sitting in front of the sun. So 
there is a lot of evidence uh, pointing to this theory, but I didn't want to overwhelm this uh, and derail the presentation here. So I've just shown you a little bit of it. The origin, so Graham Hancock and Robert Bouval in the excellent book, Talisman, Secret Cities, Secret Faith. They identified the root of the word Paris. Paris derives from the temple of Isis in Pharos in Alexandria, Egypt. And Pharos Isis became Far Isis that later became Paris because the site of the Notre Dame in Paris was actually a Roman temple to the goddess Isis. Within the Roman Empire, six to seven percent of the Romans worshipped Isis. And uh, the site where Notre Dame stands today was a temple, was a very important temple and a pilgrimage sp uh, spot to Isis. And that's where you get the word Paris from. Um, Alexandria, Egypt was the site of the one of the seven wonders of the world, the, the, the lighthouse at Alexandria. Now let's see what they did in Alexandria, Virginia. The Masons built the Washington Masonic Monument as a replica of the of the uh, of the White House at Alexandria. The White House at Alexandria was an important. The uh, region surrounding it, Pharos, uh, was an important uh, uh, pilgrimage place uh, of ISIS. In fact, the light that shone from the uh, from the lighthouse was called the Stella Maris or the star of the sea, which is another word for Isis. Isis is called queen of heaven and is called star of the sea. And the, uh, they, and the Masons replicated what was there in Alexandria, Egypt, and they replicated it in Alexandria, Virginia. And I know there are a lot of brethren from Virginia uh, in this uh, uh, call. So I thought this would be interesting just to show uh, to you. That this was um, the George Washington National Masonic Memorial was a huge achievement uh, in this country because we had um, they just I think they just celebrated their centennial a couple of years ago so it took contributions from all forty some uh, forty eight Grand Lodges across the country every Grand Lodge one of one of we had a recent paper that we published about the Masonic Memorial and, and what went involved in building the original structure. If you think about it, um, there were like 48 different Grand Lodges in the country at the time that were all asked to contribute and all of them had to pledge a certain amount. I think like every, every Mason in every Grand Lodge was charged an extra dollar or something like that all across the country to fund this building a whole lot of effort went into basically the entire country of Masons had to contribute into building this structure. It was a huge undertaking at the time. And I've only been in there, actually been in the building, I think once or twice. Uh, I had the privilege of helping confer a master Masons degree one time. We drove up where I live is about four hours from DC. So we drove up there for the day and uh, did a master Masons degree. I want to go back. I lived in the area for a while and never bothered to go and visit. And I'm kicking myself now because I lived around DC for like five years and it was within short driving distance and I never went and took the tour. But they have um, every room, they have rooms dedicated to all the different Masonic bodies, all the different pendant bodies, to the DMLA, to the youth groups. And it's just an impressive building. It's definitely worth traveling to. But I was not aware that they modeled it after the the great lighthouse, but I definitely see the similarities. But that's a structure we can all be proud of because we all helped pay for it a hundred years ago, which is why they're raising money now. I think to uh, to do a little uh, renovations and run all to it. But uh, it, it is a very impressive building, and I remember seeing it every day, riding into work on the uh, on the train. Uh, we, we'd stop in Alexandria, and I'd look and I'd take pictures because from the train station you get a good view of it, you get some good shots of it. So it's a it's a beautiful building. 
Wow. Uh, yeah, Washington DC is once again uh, built in the district of the goddess. And uh, the goddess Columbia is also a representation of Isis. Um, so that I won't go into that because that's the whole rabbit hole and that will take a whole hour here. I just don't want to derail the presentation. But thank you for thank you for uh, letting us know. I didn't know the uh, the history behind the Washington Monument. I didn't know everybody actually uh, all the forty eight lodges actually contributed. Oh, now, and by the way, to be clear, the, that's not the Washington Monument. The Washington Monument, no, 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 is the no. obelisk. Uh, yes, the obelisk. Yeah, but the, uh, yeah, the sorry, I I misspoke here. I if that's okay. If if anyone's interested, go look up Cleopatra's needle because the obelisk you showed two obelisks early on there about the pillars. Uh, supposedly, Cleopatra's needle was moved from Egypt, I think, to London, and when they took it apart and put it back together, there were a whole bunch of Masonic symbols found in the base of the obelisk. But the Washington <laughs> Monument itself is an obelisk; it's one of the biggest in the world, and. Um, it's very much an Egyptian structure that we adopted. And I think Masons could definitely find a lot of interesting things if you began exploring um, the Washington Monument and other obelisks. It is the center point of DC. If you look at it on a map, DC was originally a diamond shape. And we, yes. they seeded part of it back to Virginia, but it's a 10 mile by 10 mile diamond. The exact center is the Washington Monument and the Congress and the Capitol building and the White House are off of those lines. So definitely Masons were involved in erecting the, uh, the city of DC. It's not a secret by any means. We hired, Washington hired Masonic architects to help lay it out like long font. And there's a lot of symbolism we wove into laying out the city. It's not a secret at all. It's not done behind anyone's back. It was very overtly at the time. Washington chose Masons to help lay out the city. And there's a lot of Masonic symbolism that is expressed in the streets. But it wasn't a huge secret that we hid from the world. It's very obvious that we did it and why we did it. But that's a talk in itself is Washington, D.C. and all of the symbolism there. And, uh, can can uh... Uh, Brother Chris, can somebody uh, do a research on the obelisk? Because I read a little bit of that because it's a Masonic symbolism and the obelisk, besides the, the obelisk in Egypt, in, the, uh, in Europe, in the United States, which is the Washington Monument, there's two more obelisks that is very uh, significant uh, Masonic symbols. Uh, one is in, uh, in, in the Vatican. And I believe there's one in Paris or in, in uh, France or something like that. Those are the biggest obelisks uh, uh, that uh, the Masonic symbols uh, are very significant for Freemasons if they know. So, I, I do know I, when I was master the first time, I paid to have this team come from Northern Virginia and give a talk on Cleopatra's needle. I still have, I think, the the background materials they gave me. But if you want to, I, I put it in the chat there. If anyone wants to Google Cleopatra's Needle, um, they talk about that particular obelisk or series of obelisks. And I'll do some digging, but I guarantee you there are other Masonic papers that refer to the obelisk. I'll see about putting some at our, um, on our Facebook uh, group for people to check out later. Thank you. <clears throat> so the question is, what did those nine poor knights of Christ find under the Temple Mount? What did they find? There's a bunch of theories on this, you know, and this is worth a lecture in itself. But let me just cover it briefly. Some people say they found the Holy Grail. Some people say they found Enoch's cube. Brother Tarani, I, I, I don't want to rush you. We could probably go on all day, but it is coming up at 1130. So okay. you can talk as long as you feel you need to, to, to come to a conclusion, but we have been going over an hour. I'm sure everybody's enjoying this, but I just don't want to, I don't want to overwhelm everybody. <laughs> sure. No, no, no. It's, it's very enjoyable. So, it's go very as long as you like. I'm just making you aware of the time. I'm enjoying this very much. Yes. Okay. I'm That's not telling anybody to stop. Too. I'm just giving you and telling you where we are. Okay. Uh, so there's a bunch of theories on what the Templars actually found. I'll be brief here. First theory is that they found uh, they found Christ's uh, 
holy grail. The second theory is that they found Enoch's cube, which was placed there by Enoch from before the great flood. Enoch dug nine chambers under the temple and there he put a cube of agate. Within the cube of agate, there was a golden triangle engraved with the holy name of God, the Yodhe Vavhe, the Tetragrammaton. And this is the basis of Royal Arch Masonry. Those, those brothers who are members of the Royal Arch know the story much better than I. And this is a whole lecture in itself, so I won't get into it. Yeah, we did that. Yeah. Uh, the th other theory is that they found the Ark of the Covenant. And the other theory is they didn't find any knowledge, any uh, treasure at all. The treasure that they found was actually knowledge, hermetic knowledge that had come from ancient, Greek, uh, ancient Egypt. And uh, the god thought, uh, the source of all ancient uh, Egyptian knowledge, then became Hermes. As knowledge moved, like you say in masonry, knowledge uh, originated in the East and spread its benign influence westward. From Egypt, it came to Greece with Pythagoras and with uh, uh, all the people who had visited uh, Solon and uh, the other Greeks who had visited uh, ancient Egypt. Uh, and thought changed to Hermes. And then when it went to Rome, Hermes changed to Mercury. So this symbolizes the transfer of knowledge from the east to, uh, from east to west. And Hermes is very significant to Freemasons. Let's see what Mackey has to say about Hermes. This is uh, Hermes shown on the Manitoba Legislative Building. I have a whole presentation on the Manitoba Legislative Building. And if you guys are interested, I can give that also at some point. But in all the old manuscripts uh, that talk about the um, Legend of the Craft mentioned is made of Hermes as the father of masonry. The father of wisdom, he found one of the two pillars on which uh, the science was written and he taught it to man. This is from Mackey's Encyclopedia of Freemasonry. So this once again points to the ancient Egyptian roots of uh, Freemasonry. One of the theories, but I think there's a lot of, a lot of support uh, for that theory. The Keepers of the Lost Ark. Now, if you Google the top supposed locations of the Ark of the Covenant, the top ones, uh, one, one of the top ones is Shatra Cathedral. And they said that it makes absolute sense because if you are bringing back the Ark of the Covenant back to Europe with you, and you want to hide it from the church and you want to hide it from the king and these people have eyes and ears everywhere what would you do with it you would bury it but not just bury it anywhere you would bury it on sacred ground you can bury it on holy ground and Sha and uh, the the ark is actually they say that it's buried under the crypts in shatra cathedral and that's why the the Masons, the, the Templars put it there and they built a cathedral on top of it so that nobody's ever going to smash the cathedral to recover the Ark. That's just one theory. The other theory is when the Templars were arrested in 1307, a faction of the Templars took the Ark and they went north to Rosslyn Chapel and they put it there. It's buried in Rosslyn Chapel. This is a pillar part of Shatra Cathedral known as the portal of the initiates. It shows the Ark being transported on a wheeled cart. Where is it being transported? By whom is it being transported? That is unknown at this point in time. We don't know what they were trying to represent over here. But one country openly claims to possess the Ark. Does anybody want to guess which country? They openly claim, yes, we have the Ark of the Covenant and it's there to this day. There are 50,000 churches in this country and yeah. every church yeah. has a replica of the yeah. Ark of the Covenant. Ethiopia. Ethiopia? Yes. They say the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to show the Masonic obsession with the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant is represented in the uh, the uh, 
ugly, the United Grand Lodge of England, the building that I showed you earlier, the coat of arms. Here it is, the Ark of the Covenant, surrounded by being beings called the Cherubim. Um, we're supposed to protect the Ark. Here in the Manitoba Legislative Building, this is a building which is uh, which is a, basically an encyclopedia of Masonic knowledge. Uh, and I can cover this uh, at a later lecture if, if there is interest from the group. There is a building, there is a box called a war chest surrounded by winged beings. And people, the researchers have actually measured this chest and they've, it matches the, uh, the dimensions of the Ark of the Covenant as given in the Bible. And it's surrounded by two winged beings. Uh, is it the same people. proportion or is it the exact size? It's the exact size. Exact size. And there is more about the Ark of the Covenant in this building that I can touch upon uh, in a later lecture if there is interest from the group. But Brother Manan, what is this? What building is this? Is this the UGLE? No, this is the Manitoba Legislative Building. Oh, Manitoba. Okay. This is Canada. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Thank you. <laughs> so the Ethiopians say that the Ark of the Covenant is located here. In Aksum, in Ethiopia, St. Mary of Zion's Cathedral, and a lone monk takes the charge of uh, being the keeper of the Ark. Now, the book that I showed you previously, written by Graham Hancock and Robert Buwal, the researcher Graham Hancock spent several years living in Ethiopia investigating this claim. And he said that a person, when he becomes a keeper of the Ark, he lives a very short life. And all of them seem to develop cataracts. And he befriended several of the uh, keepers of, and they never leave the complex. Hey, once you become a keeper of the ark, you die. Uh, you only leave the complex once you die. And <clears throat> all of them develop cataracts. So he asked them, he asked them, why do you have these cataracts? And they all said, it's because of the ark. And the ark is a thing of fire. Now, you make what you will of it, but the, the, a lot of people seem to think it is in Ethiopia. And, and every Ethiopian I've ever met is adamant that yes, we do have the Ark. And the Ark was taken there by uh, Queen of Sheba's son. The Queen of Sheba traveled to uh, uh, Israel and uh, King Solomon got her pregnant and she went back and had a son who was called Menelik. And when he was 20 years old, she sent him back to meet uh, uh, King Solomon. And he took the ark and took it back, brought it back to Ethiopia. That is What's the, the name of this building again? This is uh, Mary of Zion's Cathedral in Aksum, Ethiopia. Because this was also in uh, the, the talk two weeks ago, those of you I'm trying to remember who was here two weeks ago when Brother Sanders gave his talk, but I remember this exact picture when he was talking about ley lines or something. He mentioned this very building. Wow. So that's uh, that's kind of giving me chills here. See, it's like, wait a minute, I've seen this before. <laughs> a lot of people seem to think it's a forgery that the Ethiopians don't really have the ark, but nobody's really seen it. So you can't uh, really say, but this is a theory, and it's one of the eight. Uh, like, if you Google the top ten places where the Ark of the Covenant is, number one is Aksum, number two is uh, uh, Rosslyn Chapel, and number three is Shatra Cathedral. I, have you put this on Google Earth and drawn lines to it? No, I have not. But I Maybe should. You should do that. that. <laughs> Maybe I'll do that. <laughs> yeah, you should do that, and let us know what you find. Uh, now we come to Shart's last mystery. And this mystery was hidden in plain sight for 700 years. 700 years, people have wondered. There is a labyrinth in Shart. It is called the journey of the soul, which is there in Shart. And all the pilgrims walk the labyrinth to the center basically representing uh, the winding journey of the soul as it reaches completion. 
people for 700 years wondered why are there 112 cogs within this labyrinth why 112 it has no significance it is not a significant number like 153 72 33 it has no significance to anyone was it just like coincidence to just randomly put it and they didn't think about it and in the 1970s this is the labyrinth without the people on it in the 1970s a researcher called john james 1977 john james was sitting in the pew here and he was just looking at it wondering about 112 and then he looked up and he saw the rose window and he realized wait a minute the rose window if superimposed upon the labyrinth fits perfectly upon the labyrinth and then he realized the cathedral builders are paying tribute to one man. Jabir bin Hayan, the father of modern chemistry. He was a prominent alchemist. He was known as Jebber in the West. And he gave a very, very early version of the periodic table where he said there are 112 elements in manifest creation. There are 112 elements under the canopy of heaven. Today, we know that he was off by six elements because the periodic table actually contains 118. Two thousand nineteen was the International Year of the Periodic Table, and UNESCO celebrated the life and works of Jebber. But why? Okay, one uh, one uh, theory is that uh, the cathedral builders wanted to represent the architecture of the universe, which is comprised of hundred and twelve elements. But, but is there uh, is there something else to it? It's the stained glass. And the cathedral builders left the stone window there, exact same size as the labyrinth, as a clue that one day somebody who has eyes to see will put two and two together and make this connection. One of Jebber's greatest achievements was in glass making. And the stained glass of the cathedrals comes from the Islamic world. This is a rare example of stained glass in Shiraz, Iran. One of the Shiraz. rare examples that actually survived the Mongol invasions. Mm. Mongols thrashed my, my ancestral country of Iran. They thrashed the place. And this is one of the rare examples that survived. And Jebba is created, is credited with creating the stained glass of the cathedrals. And what is so special about the stained glass of the cathedrals? One of the greatest mysteries of Gothic architecture is the stained glass used by the cathedral windows. It first appeared in the early 12th century, but disappeared just as suddenly 100 years later. It's a lost art of making that glass. To this day, people don't know how the glass was made. Nothing like it has ever been seen before and nothing like it has ever been seen since. Not only is the luminosity of Gothic glass greater than any other, but its light enhancement qualities are far more effective. Unlike the stained glass of other architectural schools, its interior effect is, say, is the same, whether the light outside is bright or dim. Even in twilight, this glass retains its brilliance way beyond that of any other. This is a lost art. And to this day, scientists don't know what gives a uh, cathedral grasses vibrancy, whether it is bright and sunny outside or whether it is dusk. The interior of the cathedral is always the same amount of brightness. And the cathedral builders were paying tribute to this Arab alchemist. Of course, as uh, Chris mentioned, if they would have told the church 
that, hey, man, we want to pay a tribute to this Arab alchemist in your uh, uh, cathedral to Notre Dame, they would have been promptly were burnt at the stake. So that's why they kept it a secret. And it remained a secret for 700 years. This was wow. quite shocking. I thought, I, I, did everyone understand it? I mean, do you, do you have any questions? I, I want to say something about it. Is this, are you, do you have more or is this the end of your presentation? Just two more slides. Okay. If I could say about the, about the, the we, we've seen at least two examples, maybe some other ones I missed, but at least two examples you've had here of where the architects of this one cathedral drew on things and if they were up front with the church with the cardinal or whoever in charge of you know basically the the customer telling them to build this building and they said hey there's this arab guy who was a chemist and we're going to pay tribute to his stained glass and and the periodic table the catholic church with their mindset <laughs> then maybe now uh would be <laughs> like uh, i don't think so you're out of here you're a heretic and they bring in somebody else to finish the building right so Not only that, they would have been burnt at the stake. Oh, absolutely. They're, they're heretics. But here's something for all, all, all my brothers to, to consider here. Is I want you all to think about this. Um, I hear this comes up time and again in, um, in masonry and people talk about esoteric knowledge, which is knowledge which is hidden as opposed to esoteric, exoteric, which is visible. Why does masonry hide its knowledge? Why doesn't Mason just come out and say, hey, we're a school of architecture. There are five orders of architecture. Here's what they mean. We hide. The, the meaning to Masonry is just below the surface. We don't come into Masonry and we say, this is what you need to do. It's here's a story. Here's another story. Here's an allegory. Here's a symbol. And I, I get people, I hear, I hear people asking these questions. Why do we bother to hide the knowledge? Well, there's a reason to hide the knowledge. There's a reason you don't just sit down. If you go to a college right now and you want to take a class on engineering, they will teach you engineering. There's no subterfuge. It's like, here, here's geometry, here's engineering, here's how you apply it. Masonry teaches things where it's a level below the surface. A lot of Masons can go through Masonry. They can receive all the degrees and they come away thinking, oh, Masonry is this fun organization where brothers can come together and they don't delve more than an inch below the surface. There are Masons who will learn the lectures, Masons who memorize and can confer the degrees as good as anyone, and they have no idea what the meaning is just below the surface. So we also, if I may, Chris, yeah. say I'm shows, into that, Chris. It, Go ahead, Robert. Sorry. It, it will show the universality of Masonry that it comes from east to west and west to east right and right. all in between and you know if you know with what's going on you know that's in some ways how it could be a unifying thing but yet at the same time you've got so many groups of people out there that want to say it's just their way right well my, my point was that i was getting to is here, if we consider that what we have in masonry today is the same thing that was taught in the 1700s and assuming masonry was around then, the 1200s, the 1400s, when you built the cathedrals, you couldn't be up front and say, here's the symbolism, the reason that we built this labyrinth, the reason that we put the stained glass here, the reason that these chakras are here on the facade and in the floor plan. You can't just come out and say overtly, this is teaching from the Far East about, about chakras. You can't be honest with your customer who's letting you build this building to say, here's why I built it this way. They had to hide it behind symbolism upon pain of death. So we modern day Masons only have what's handed down generation to generation, and we tend to cover up with the symbolism and we kind of forget the underlying layer. The reason there's symbolism is, number one, because if you're going to become a true Mason and understand what this organization is really about, and it's not just about having our meetings and eating green beans and the fellowship and all like that, 
there's something below the surface. Not every mason is going to dig below the surface. Now, but it, not it's only the universality that, of it. At the time it was written, at the time it was all pulled together, you would be killed if you openly shared this wisdom. So only it was to preserve the greater meanings here, the greater knowledge to survive the dark times when men weren't receptive to letting that information get out. Or maybe they didn't want that information shared with the entire populace. Only those in power got to hold on to it. We can't have the common man knowing this knowledge. They won't tolerate our ruling if they know it. Mm -hmm. So just my thought. Hey, this Chris, mm -hmm. that was mentioned in one of the lectures that the EA assembled on the first floor. The FC is going to be the middle chamber. And the Master Masons has a different rooms so that the knowledge will not be imparted. Okay. And it takes a little bit of time maybe to, to provide those knowledge, which is, again, I was basing it to what you said, to the allurement of yours that about something below the surface, you just cannot give that knowledge to somebody else. That's what my understanding for that was my theory about it. Good point. Well, mine is that it's the universality of it all, that it's east to west, west to east, and north to south. It's, it's, it's what is showing what is the essence of being human, I guess. Right. And how we are related to our spiritual being. And this is why I love Masonry. You have three different opinions, and each one, each it, it's very personal to each and every one of us. It means something else to Chris. It means something else to you. It means something else to me. You know, and this is why uh, I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, how does our story end? We know what happened to the Templars, 1307, Friday the 13th, 1307, they were rounded up and all burnt at the stake. There were other Christian orders which had secret knowledge within them, hermetic knowledge that had come from uh, the East, the Manichees, the Carthers, all the, and the Templars, they were all destroyed by the Catholic Church. But the Catholic Church was unable to implement a permanent dark age because this man, Cosimo Medici, he brought back a collection of books called the Corpus Hermetica, or a collection of works attributed to the legendary Hermes, back to Europe, back to Florence. And that kick-started a major event in humanity. Does anybody want to guess what that was? Renaissance. It was the Italian Renaissance. And once again, from the darkness, Europe managed to emerge back into the light. Thank you. Manan, I got a question. What was that uh, mystery of the labyrinth? What is, is that a cathedral somewhere else? In Iran, right? Shiraz, Iran? The, the stained glass is in Shiraz, Iran. What's but that again? Shiraz. In Iran. Shiraz. Okay. But that labyrinth is in Chartres Cathedral, is it not? Labyrinth is in Chartres Cathedral. Ah, oh. oh, okay. Got but it. he showed the stained glass that. Yes, yes, yes. Thank the you. That's all. From, uh, in the, 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 the Muslim world uh, and then uh, spread. Thank you. I hope you. Uh, I hope the brethren enjoyed this. I'm sorry it uh, took a little. Yes. Bit. Yes. Oh, it was wonderful. Yes, I, and I, wonderful. I loved Absolutely, it, brother. Thank you. Very good. Very interesting. Thank you so much. You've done a lot of work. All right. Yeah, I, I, I think everybody really enjoyed. We, we, we held on to most of. Some people begged off. They had to leave, and they, they chatted with me. They had to leave. So. Chris, when is the next? Oh yeah, I, I was going to cover all that. If there are any more questions, uh, for the um, for our uh, for brother uh, Tarani presentation. Any other questions? Anybody comments? Anybody wants to make? Um, uh, maybe comments, uh, addendum, uh, that uh, somebody else would be uh, presenting the uh, obelisk and it's, uh, 
it has a lot of significant uh, Masonic symbols, uh, I would say. I will, um, I will look into finding someone to give a talk on that. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm looking forward to that, Chris, Brother Chris. And um, uh, Brother Chris, uh, could I ask uh, Brother Tehrani, um, <clears throat> I'm in Ontario District, just east of Toronto East. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. Are we are we friends already? Can you share your uh, email in the chat or share it to Chris and then he can share it to me? Would you mind? And share it to a lot of brothers who are presented to if you don't mind at all. So that Thank if you, in brother. the future we fun. have uh, questions, then we could uh, hit them with an email, I guess. Thank you. If that's OK, and it might help them uh, as I think he found out a few new ideas from the questions. The questions. Yes. Yeah, and you know, if, if there is, if you guys are interested in uh, me coming to your lodge in a Zoom call and actually uh, sharing the same presentation, I'm happy to do so as long as the timing uh, uh, works out for me. And uh, yeah, I enjoyed giving the present. I enjoyed researching the material. It is quite fascinating. I, I found the ISIS connection really shocking and uh, the Ark of the Covenant. I've been doing some, a lot of research on the Ark of the Covenant, and uh, I know the Nazis dug extensively around Rennes-le-Chateau looking for the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah. Uh, this is within France. And uh, there are theories on the Ark of the Covenant that are covered in my... Uh, I gave a presentation on the Manitoba Legislative Building. I don't know if there's interest here in this group, but I can give the same presentation. Uh, I'd be happy to bring yeah. you back, Brother Tarani. Yeah, I mean, please. I, I think there are yeah. several other several things you touched on and said, well, that deserves another talk. So by all means, we can't cover it all in one hour. We're, we're running oh, no. on 12. So, But that's good. <laughs> it, 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 there definitely seems interest, and we enjoyed your presentation. I'm yeah. sure have, people have to have you come back. Thank um, you. Oh, Brother Steve, Thank I you, wanted brother to brother. say hi. You joined us late. Good to have you with us. Other Brother Steve. <laughs> Hey, it's good yes. to Steve. Yeah. And um, I, I did want to say well, any other any other comments about the presentation before I wrap up? I don't want to cut anybody off. Outstanding. I enjoyed it, Chris. I Thank really you. enjoyed it. It's, it has been very interesting. Yes. Thank you. Harry. I think this is definitely what we, uh, the kind of thing that we want to um, to present here. This is the exactly the direction we want to take. Um, I did well, want to mention something I meant to want to start at the beginning, but a couple of people left before I got to say to everybody, but um, I want to, the, the word of the day, I'll put it that way, is edify or edification. To edify is to instruct or improve someone morally or intellectually. Um, I want to edify my brothers here. I think all Masons should work to edify and it, it's, it's, it basically means you want to uplift, to support, to compliment, but to raise up your brothers. We need to edify each other. So I just want to edify all of the brothers who are still here and those who come back and watch on YouTube that left before I got to say this. Um, I value you all greatly. I appreciate you all making the effort, uh, especially those of you who've been here many times over the last year or so. But uh, you all are contributing to something and making it better by your presence. So I'm glad you are all here. So thank you all for being here. But we, Chris, Masons don't definitely. My name. Yes, <laughs> Masons Brother need Chris, to edify each other. I appreciate all you do and and your uh, <clears throat> steady as a rock on your mission. And we're thankful that you are always trying to edify us and uplift us and make us better men and Masons. Thank you, brother. Well, I, I appreciate that. And that this, well, this rock got covered with water for a bit, but the rock has emerged once again. <laughs> Hopefully, it'll, it'll stay above the water line. Uh, we, we did take a bit of a break, and I want to keep doing this. Um, I will uh, talk about, oh, and Brother Brian messaged me. He couldn't, he's sorry, he couldn't make it. Um, I managed to make it without my co host uh, for once. I don't know how. Brian is very helpful. At, adding people to the, to the, to the meetings. So I didn't have to maintain that, but I had to do it all myself here, but I managed. Um, Brother Chris, uh, yeah. I um, was a little under the weather, but I have uh, zoom pro. So 
perhaps the next time I come, I can offer my service, not to take away from you being the host, okay. but I well, can let people in. We have a bigger I like group. to. You don't have, well, I guess you don't have to actually have, I think as long as you sign in with Zoom, you have the ability to, as long as you have Zoom installed, you can, oh, I can okay. make you a co-host. Yeah, but, yeah, I will write to you then the next time. And okay, I'll, be I'll keep computer. you in mind as a co-host. I definitely could use it. I would like, and since I have both my wardens here, I would like to grow this to the point where we have several members of the Research Lodge here, and it's not, I'm not the single point of failure. I think anybody who works for the government or the military knows that term. If I'm sick, if I have another obligation, I can't host the meeting, and I'm the only guy hosting the meetings. So I want to grow this to the point where it lives on without me being present. As much as I enjoy being here and running it, I see there are times when we could have had a meeting and something came up and I couldn't host it, so we had to cancel. And I just hate that. I want it to be, as much as I enjoy it all being about me, as my wife likes to say, it's always about you. Uh, <laughs> I don't want it to happen. <laughs> I don't want it to have to always be about me. I'm happy to be the catalyst that makes it start. But uh, if I can rely on other people, so I'm not a single point of failure, this thing can go on if I can't make it one week. So I want to get to that point. Um, next, next Saturday, February 19th at 10 a.m., we are meeting in person. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, both the master and myself will not be there. Um, I have a, um, a funeral, sadly, a, a good friend of mine, a brother, uh, Jack Pallet, has passed. He and his wife are very active in, um, in Job's Daughters when I was in DMLA, and uh, their daughter and I have been friends for a long time, and um, he, he's recently passed. He's been sick for some time, but uh, his, his memorial will be on Saturday at some time, so I'm just going to plan on that, regardless of what time it is. I can't make it up to Richmond and back, so... So I will not be there. No Rooster's under the weather, so he will not be there. So our very capable brother, Robert Chuck Bronson, will be our senior warden. <laughs> Robert, will be present. I will be there. Yes, I will be there. And we appreciate it. Uh, brother Joe Martinez, uh, who spoke here, and he'll be speaking again in the unstated meetings. He will be our guest speaker, and he will be speaking on uh, the application <laughs> of esotericism in the craft. I'm really disappointed that I won't be able to be there for that. But that is going to be next Saturday. And this will go out in the emails and all, but I'm letting you all know. It'll be next Saturday at 10 a.m. in person in beautiful Highland Springs. Two weeks from today, I always like to announce our upcoming unstated. Uh, Brother Stephen Tieft will be our guest speaker. He will speak on American military lodges. Is that you, Steve? Okay, I just have Steve. Are you Steve Tieft? Yeah, that's me. Am I saying it right, Tieft? You are. are. Okay, I, I'm sorry. I only have your first name, so I don't know. Well, good. I'm glad you made it, at least for most of this. Steve will be speaking on American military lodges through the ages. I'm very much looking forward to that. That will be on Saturday, February 26th at 10 a.m. So um, I'm managing to line up actually a month ahead of time. I'm doing my best to get several speakers lined up so I'm not scrambling the week of. It's like, who am I going to talk this week? Uh, so I'm trying to buffer it out. I want to announce there's going to be a very special unstated meeting in March or April. No, probably March or April. We have been asked by uh, the Masonic Herald, which is our uh, paper or our magazine for the Grand Lodge of Virginia. Um, the, uh, the Masonic Herald asked me to write an article on the research lodges in Virginia. And they want me to interview a few people from the other research lodges. So we decided it makes sense to have an unstated meeting where the panelists will be uh, wise and well-informed brethren from each of our five research lodges in the state. And I'll ask them various questions about how, how their research lodge is different from the others, what they do, what they focus on, and some of the, some of the history of them, what significant things that they've done in the past. So I got away with turning an article into one of our unstated and that get them on here to do a panel discussion of everybody, which should be a lot of fun. And then I'll be able to take a transcript of that and uh, write my article from that. So that'll be really good. That'll be upcoming, I'll announce it. But this is a way to bring attention to the research lodges uh, for the whole state of Virginia and all the Masons who don't know much about it. This will be in the Herald telling more brothers about the research lodges 
it also helps me get some good panelists on here and have a good discussion specifically about the research lodges. I think that'll be good for everybody. So all the way around, uh, it, it's a multiplier. I'm, I'm getting a lot of, <laughs> I'm getting, squeezing all I can out of this concept. But it, it's an honor to be asked to write a paper uh, for the for an article for the Herald and a chance to uh, bring more Masons into the fold. Because we have other research lodges and some of them have attended here in the past where the Shelby Chandler is big with uh, Civil War and George Washington Lodger Research and others. So um, that's going to be a lot of fun. So basically every two weeks, I plan to have an unstated meeting. If we have to adjust, I, I planned it around our stated. So we're not interfering with that, of course. But I will keep having these every two weeks through 2022 as much as I can. I'll try to have different speakers um, and have a little variety here. Uh, oh, th oh, crap. We lost our we lost Brother Tarani. But OK. Uh, anybody else have any wrap ups, anything you want to say before we break? I appreciate you all sticking out to the end, the last eight of you. But well, Chris, it's wonderful to be back with uh, my brothers to the south. And uh, I'm going to keep in touch with Brother Tarani. And I have two brothers up here that could speak as well. So I'll, Very good. Uh, I will talk to them and uh, we'll connect uh, uh a couple of good topics I know, and one brother's written a book on Robert. I don't. Have you ever had Robert Lund, L U N D? I did. Yes, he gave oh, a talk here. Okay. Yeah, he's done. He's done the three books, one, two, three. But anyway, he's very. You know, depends if you got something to plug in there. He'll be glad to do it. I've already spoken yes. to him. I'd, I'd be happy to bring him back. Yes, I remember. It was you one know, of the, third, the second and the third degree, all the esoteric symbols and he explains yep. them quite well yes uh, and i appreciate that any of you if you know of it if you're willing to be a speaker or if you have someone that you want to recommend a speaker they can email me or contact me on facebook um, i'm more than happy to uh sign them up i want to get a good variety of speakers in here and i'm up uh, since i'm doing it every other week i, I definitely am going to need constant uh, constant flow of speakers so any ideas i'm more than receptive to ideas you have Thank for you. Um, for I think it's good work. Any brother, anything else? I appreciate it. It's, it's been a wonderful. Yeah. Uh, th I've enjoyed it today. You know, Very good. I'm a shy, bashful person myself, you know, and I'm not much to speak. <laughs> I'm a good <laughs> listener, but I'm not no big talker. <laughs> well, you, you can just, just fund the yes, operation. Sir. That's yes. all we ask. <laughs> uh, and he enjoys the uh, knife and fork uh, part of the meeting, too. <laughs> like we all do. We all do. You just admitted yeah. we all do, Brother Rooster. Yeah. Yep. Very good. Okay. Yeah. Thank you all for coming. You all have a wonderful uh, weekend, and and uh, I'll see you all soon. Blessing Thank you. Everyone. Everybody have a it's wonderful, wonderful day. You have a great weekend, rest of you, Cheers, everybody. everybody. Blessings to your family that had the loss there, the good brother. Yes, thank you. All right. Bye-bye.